Welcome to Western Wisconsin Journal. My name is Bobby Pominville, and I'm your reporter on the arts. And I try to cover all the facets of the arts. So today, I have a guest who is a librarian in Hudson, the director of the library. And I'm really excited to talk to you, Shelley. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And I do want to introduce you because you have such interesting resume. Um, you have bachelor's degrees in political science and journalism. Mm -hmm. Right now you're in grad school for a master's in library information science. Yes. That goes yes. perfectly with your job, <laughs> doesn't does, it? Yes. <laughs> now you grew up in River Falls. You worked at the Mankato Free Press. You transitioned, oh, I'm sorry, I will say that again. You transitioned into a career of public relations, community engagement, and advocacy. Yes. That is impressive. You are the author of 17 children's books, including yes. four novels. Mm -hmm. That is really inspiring to me, too. Thank you. Now, you, you were working at the Hudson Library. You became the interim director. And you were hired as director of the library in September of 2021. Yes. Now, that's kind of a infamous month around here. So will you tell yes. us, please, what happened that September? Well, that I'll September. tell you that I was officially on the job 16 days when a certain storm blew into town. And it was like 4.30 in the morning. Uh, I got a text um, from our custodian, and it said, the front of the library is gone. I was like, well, welcome to the September 17th. Oh. And um, it has just been, you know, really crazy since then. And, you know, I, I thought when um, Madeline Page and I became interim directors that the most difficult part of our career ever would be, you know, negotiating the pandemic. And then yes. September 17th came and I would say that has certainly been the most difficult part of um, our time together at the Hudson Library. And, you know, the first I heard of it, uh, I live in North Hudson, and there was a nasty wind that went through there. Yeah. And trees were going down and so on, and houses even. But I watched the news eventually, and then I watched the news again and again and yeah. again. And it was a video of the library. <laughs> yes. yes. And I thought, I do not remember it looking anything like this. Mm -hmm. And we had that beautiful front, mm -hmm. the windows, the design. Yeah, it's so it was, beautiful. It was gorgeous. Yeah. I've always enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. So you must have had a lot of damage. Yes. Um, it, you know, it's been quite an adventure because it, people have had damage to your car or to your home. And a public building is such an entirely different process altogether. Yes. And, uh, you know, we were fully closed for 15 weeks. And that is a long period of time. And I can tell you there are two reasons, and it's glass and carpet. Oh. Those were uh, the two reasons. So first, the glass issue, you know, blew in the windows, it blew in part of the beach. <laughs> we had sand everywhere. And the glass, you know, it, it's in the books, it's in the carpet, it's everywhere. And so they had to bring in a special firm that could do the cleaning, but then inspect and clean every single book in the library to make sure that, I mean, those shards of glass, you wouldn't believe how small that they get. They also just went through like the ventilation system, so we weren't breathing in hazardous material. Some things that you probably normally wouldn't have to think about. No, I never would have thought of that. Yes. But even the glass in the books. Oh, yes, yes. I couldn't believe that. Yes. So that took a very long time for that process. Now, meanwhile, this is something people probably don't think about, but a library usually has 50 to 60% of their books in the building. Everything else is checked out, right? Yeah. So 
we're closed and our books are stuck on the shelves waiting to get cleaned and inspected. Meanwhile, people are returning all their books and we can't shelve them because we can't put them next to the, you know, on these glass covered shelves with books that haven't been cleaned. So these books are just pouring in. And oh so we have to sort them into categories and boxes and then stacked boxes all over the building. They're in the hallways, by the bathrooms, they're in the computer room, they're around the public workstations. I mean, there were just boxes and boxes everywhere. <laughs> so finally everything gets cleaned and we can't just simply reshelve everything because you don't have, you don't build your library to hold 100% of your collection. There's no room. That's true. And we also have weight restrictions upstairs because we were meant to be, we were designed as an office building and converted to a library. So it's, it's a different structure. Um, so then we had to, um, we started curbside service once the books were safe so people could come in and check out books curbside like we did during the pandemic, which eventually opened up enough space for us to start putting the books away. So that was just crazy. But the main reason, once the books were ready, everything had been cleaned, is the glass on the floor. Now the company did a very thorough cleaning, of course, but it's that industrial weave that you see in a carpet. And you cannot be assured that you got all those pieces out. And we have, you know, um, all the little ones who come in and they get on their hands and knees and, you know, they got that on their hands and into their eyes or mouth. Oh my goodness. We just cert couldn't take that risk. So it was like, we can't open until we get that carpet taken care of. And the process to get the bids ready is just an extraordinary one as well. It's a public building. There's a process you have to follow. You can't just call up your friend and say, hey, you want a job? You know, you have to go through this very extensive process. And um, the construction industry is way backed up with projects because of staffing issues, pandemic, supply chain. And you have to involve architects, engineers, the insurance company, um, city staff and inspectors to just get the specifications ready to send out bids. So that certainly took some time too. And while all that was happening, we were like, we have to open. We need this building to be open. What can we do? Can we just do the carpet? Everything else, do what you need, but let's just get the carpet done. And it, that wasn't possible. It has to be part of the whole package of bids. So, you know, we all put our heads together, like what can we do to move this faster? Because it's very frustrating for people in the community and our patrons and staff. Um, finally, the idea we settled on is we, we built a wall. We built a wall around the children's area. And that enabled us to open. Oh. So, yeah, it was a very long process. Amazing. <laughs> and, but I have to tell you, I'm so glad we're open, of course, um, but there's nothing more depressing than going into a library, a public library, and not having a children's area. Oh. It's like the heart of the building has been ripped out. <laughs> Um, we are doing story times in the building again, though, but they're in the lobby. And then we have a few bins of, of children's books down there, so they still can, you know, go through and, and look at books. Oh, and, of yeah. course, we can check out materials for them, but they have to let us know what it is they want. We get it and, and get that to them, which takes away the joy of the browsing. Yes, very much so. So that was 15 weeks. Um, the bids did go out and the council, the, the last I've heard is, will vote at their next meeting. And then it will be a couple of weeks of putting contract language together and getting contracts signed. And then the firm should be ready to go. Um, what they can't tell us, but what we're hearing is supply chain issues, particularly with glass. You know, oh, we yes. have those big, beautiful glass windows. You can't just go to a store and pick those up. Those are very unusual. Yes. And also um, we're hearing that flooring, that there are significant delays with, with flooring. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and it's not going to be an easy project once it even gets here because, as I just told you, we have these weight restrictions. So we can't just move books and shelves around and then carpet. We're going to have to peel it off in sections. So they'll take a section, pack up the books, make sure that they are evenly distributed properly around the building, those boxes. Then same thing with the shelves, move them with the appropriate weight distribution and re-carpet that area. Then put it all back together and start with another section. And so we'll go through the library section by section. And I mean, that alone is, it's gonna take a few weeks and we will have to be um, closed during that. So there are going to be these periods of we're open, we're closed, we're open, we're closed. Mm -hmm. And I know that um, the firm is gonna work with us to the greatest degree possible to minimize that but it's, um, it's going to be unavoidable. See, I never would have thought yeah. about all of that. Yeah, yes. And let me just tell you a little secret. Mm -hmm. In graduate school, they don't teach you how to run a library during a natural disaster. <laughs> I can tell you that. <laughs> no, yeah. I can totally understand yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, it's like almost like a tornado in a way oh, because yeah. the winds were so brutal that night. Mm -hmm. And you hear stories about tornadoes, and I can tell you the books that we would have up on the shelves, three would be tossed over by the wind, and the next, the ones next to them would be standing as though yes. nothing had happened. And that's what you hear about tornadoes. This house not touched, this house destroyed, right next to it. Yeah. And that's sort of what the upstairs looked like. Really? Yep, things were knocked over, the things next to them were totally intact. Now, can you save the books that have glass shards in them? Um, you know, the company has expertise in that area. So, oh, like, for example, okay. most of our board books, they were hammered mm. um, and gouged. And if anything at all is wet, you don't, you know, people might go, oh, put a hair dryer on it. You'll dry it out. No, it turns to mold. Yeah, It's just a matter of when. So... Oh those books all have had to be removed. And of course, we do have insurance coverage on the contents and the building. And it's actually a city building, oh. and we pay an occupancy fee to be there. And um, I've never been more grateful that this building is owned by the city than during this process because of the expertise Good. that they have and how wonderful they have been to work with is just extraordinary. Oh, I'm so glad yeah. to hear that. Yeah, they're just a fabulous team. We're really lucky. I do know that people really missed it. And the pandemic had already thrown a little yeah. problem into it all. Yeah. But then this came up, and that, so that's four months out just to start. Yes, and the children's area is still closed. And so between the pandemic and the storm, this is what tears at me every day, is we have a generation of young kids in Hudson now yeah. who have not lived the, the story time experience, like coming to the library with mom, dad, babysitter, yes. grandparents, going to story time with Miss Sarah, looking through all the books, maybe grabbing one and sitting on grandpa's lap and reading. Yeah. And we have a sensory wall, we have a Lego wall, we have all these learning toys, and we set up on um, these tables with crafts for kids to do and tape up on the windows, and they're so proud when we put up their art. Two and a half years, I mean, by the time this is over, it could be a full three years that kids in our community have been in, unable to do that. And that makes me, it's, it's that really heartbreaking. You, that makes me sad even because I worked with children and I know how they love the library yeah. at school. Yeah. And and to lose that story time. Yes. And all those other little things you do down there, I mean, to interest the children. We had a um, trick-or-treat trail out at the park for a Halloween event and um, some of the kids who came through, you know, I recognized from what at that point, a year and a half ago, you know, that they were in all the time. And I'm like, they are growing, you know. I, <laughs> like, you were this much shorter the last yes. time I saw you. And, and it was joyful to me when they recognized me and remembered me. Oh, yeah. That is such a wonderful feeling. Yeah. And a positive experience. And that's what children need. 
Yeah. They need that library. They need that beauty of reading. And mm -hmm. I, I know how much it was so important at my school. Yes. And libraries are so different from what people might remember them. Um, oh, I suppose. You know, yeah. we're not running around shushing kids. It's a place where they are joyful and they laugh and they play and they talk. That's right. And if they fall in love with the library, if they fall in love with books, it becomes a lifelong thing. That's exactly right. That's what you need. You want them to get kind of hooked on it all yeah. and it happens. And you know, they're learning to read until about, you know, grade three. And after that, they yeah. read to learn. And that's yes. how the rest of your life is. That's a good way to put it. Very good way to put it. So, um, and I just noticed in the article in the paper, mm -hmm. I think it said something about you got so many donations from the community. Yes. After people heard about it. Um, so we have a foundation, the Hudson Area um, Library Foundation, which is a separate organization. Mm -hmm. And then we also mm -hmm. have Friends of the Library. They do mm -hmm. the book sales. Mm -hmm. um, the foundation does a lot of other fundraising. Every year they do an annual fundraising campaign because we don't have any tax oh, dollars yes. for, for programs. Right. So they raise all that money for us and supplement the collection, etc. cetera. So um, after the storm, people started sending in money um, for specific to storm recovery, which was fantastic. Oh. We have insurance, but there are gonna be gaps and issues. Oh, that's right, yeah. Particularly um, landscaping. Um, wow. That is an area that's going to be short. Since you're with the Garden Club, you know how much yes. work the Garden Club has put into our oh, beautiful... Oh, I know. I, I looked over there and I went, oh, our beautiful yes. beds are gone yes. and the trees. And the trees. <laughs> that was sad. Yes. And then um, this is the first time that the Foundation has sent out a mailer that was an advocacy piece, letting Ooh. people know about our funding crisis. And normally right. the annual campaign is everything's great, look at all these wonderful things, and we still have all those wonderful things. Yes. But this year, because of the funding crisis, they're like, we need to do something a little different. Mm -hmm. And the foundation has raised more than three times their record. So the last I heard, it's in the $170,000 range. Wow, that is amazing. Phenomenal. And up until um, December is when we have to finalize our budget, right. the plan had been um, we didn't get a funding fix that we've been working toward, um, that we were going to have to close Mondays. Oh, right. Yes. And not reopen Sundays, which oh, dear. we still won't be able to do. But the foundation looked at and, and they do have a policy, and I just want to say this makes sense. They don't support operations. They don't pay for utilities and salaries and health insurance because that is the job of the municipalities. The okay. fundraising is for extra books and mm -hmm. technology and cool programs. That's what they do. Oh so, but they're like, we've had this outpouring of support and we can't ask people to donate and then be like, oh, you donated, but we're closing Mondays anyway. How do we fix oh. this? You know, that's just a horrible message to send. It is. So they gave us a large grant for collection. And that grant gave us flexibility in the budget mm -hmm. to move some of our funds around so we were able to stay open on Mondays. So oh, that's right. what those donors have done. It is incredible. Oh. And We'll still have all the programming. They didn't have to cut back. Like, if we're going to help you with this, that means we can't have summer reading or, no, we still have all those amazing programs. Oh, great. So I'm so I'm, glad to hear that. I'm just so grateful for the friends and the foundation and what they do for us. And then all the people in this community who donated. And there were 200 and some brand new donors. Oh, that is incredible. It is. We had people send checks from Minnesota. Oh, I mean, oh it's goodness. just, you know, they would, you go to the meeting with the foundation and they talk about how it was going. And I was like glad it was on Zoom so they couldn't see that I'm starting to like tear up and, oh. you know, because it was just, it was really beautiful. 
that that's just I wanted to mention that yes. because I think that's such a wonderful part of, of the recoup and getting back to normal. For sure. So you've been very innovative with your offerings and I knew that you were going to different sites, yes. even the FIPS and so yes. on. And and um so how, where are you with that now? Are you still visiting different areas? Um, to some extent, mostly we're back in the building and I'll tell you when, whether it's a personal tragedy, professional tragedy, tragedy, you find out who your friends are. And we found out we have so many friends, you know? That's great. Um, the FIPS let us come in and do story times there. Oh, yes. um, the school district let us use some of their space to do our science guide program, which is really popular. Um, the Y worked with us to do teen nights together. Oh. Um, and even Hop and Barrel, which does our Voices in the Valley series, is like, if you have a craft program or something you want, we have tables, we have space, come use it. I mean, that's the kind of response that we got. Oh, that's perfect. I know, it, it's really beautiful. So now, would you say you're back partially? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the tricky thing is going to be uh, the abrupt closures that we are not going to be able to anticipate with the construction. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this phenomenal programming staff and they have built out spring and a lot of the summer programs and they have contingency plans okay. for everything. Mm -hmm. And we are going to do a lot of things outside again, which we were doing because of the pandemic oh, right. last year. And now because we don't know what will happen with construction, but also it's great. I mean, I was having a conversation with Chris Koss from the Y about how both of our organizations are like, he's like, kids need to move and read. And I'm like, yes, and kids need to read and move. And yes. so that outside stuff was fantastic. The kids loved it. Oh. So we want to do more of that. It, it's just, you know, Wisconsin, we're kind of hostage to the weather. <laughs> That's true. And so you, it, it's the contingency planning and mm -hmm. what do you do if mm -hmm. you can't have this event. Right. So, right. So that worked out good in a lot of ways then. Yes. So now I'm, I'm looking at, we're, we're sitting here and it's March 2nd. Yes. And I'm wondering, um, what is exactly is at the library this month, or should we look ahead to April? Well, I can just mention a couple of things yeah, that I, I think would be the highlights. Okay. Um, so spring break begins uh, March 14th, and one thing that we're going to set up is um, we have a sensory room we put out, and it is so popular, and this is just great for little ones working on their um, large motor skills and their fine motor skills. Um, Super fun upstairs in our um, conference room. Okay. So that'll be there for, for kids. And um, we have um, our Science Guy event, which has become super uh, popular. Christopher Mick is our Ooh. STEM guy, and he is also a NASA educator and ambassador. I don't like to say that out loud because I don't want some library coming and taking him away from us. Wow. Let's just say he's fantastic. You are lucky to oh, have him. You know. And so on the second and fourth Tuesdays, he does the science guide program and kids come in, they get to do these really cool experiment and they all get a take home kit to do oh, something at home. That's beautiful. So love to have people sign up for that. And um, it is the NEA's big read this spring. Um, and we do that with Artreach St. Croix, fantastic mm -hmm, group. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the book this year is a book of poetry, American Sunrise. And so our um, adult librarian has organized a four-part series with local poet, um, Lee Kissling, and it's Why Read Poetry. I know about him. Yes, so it's going to be really some great, great stuff. And that's all on our website. And, oh, um, yes. So everyone can go to, excuse me, um, HudsonPublicLibrary.org and, and find that. So that's, those are some of the March highlights. Right, and we're going to put that up on the screen, too. So, um, I mean, the, the website and things like that. But, um, oh, yeah. Oh, I just love the offerings you're having. I just, they just pique my interest. And then I think about the children, how much they would love that science yes. bit. And then the, yes. um, Lee was on my show, but it's been a long time. Now I'm thinking he writes poetry, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. 
Yes. And what about, is he, does he have a theme or anything or is it kind of everything? You know, it's going to be a four part series. So oh. I know it's going to cover a lot of ground. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I'm really excited to see what he and um, Joan have that put together. great. Mm -hmm. Wow. So now that kind of takes us into spring a bit. Yes. And summer. And Actually, summer? we've been a little bit into summer. Yes. And then hopefully by next fall or close, you might have all the renovations done. But I don't know. Yeah, I, I would time. love if, if we were looking at fall, but you know, realistically, it could be longer, just depending oh, on those issues. Oh, you are looking at fall. Okay. Yeah. But so, we're still going to have a full summer reading program. And the good. theme is Oceans of Possibilities this year. Oh. And we have performances and big programs every week out uh -huh. at the parks, um, mostly on Tuesdays. Oh, right. One of them is um, the Golden Rule Magic Show, and that will be um, on a Saturday. Okay. Um, so that's going to be a really great program for families. And then we have um, outdoor story time, um, programs for all ages. So we'll have some adults, some teens, some mm -hmm. younger kids. And we have a woman, um, a teacher coming in who's going to do summer stories, steam, oh, and snacks. So the kids get to cook a little bit oh, related my. to the book that she's chosen. and. Those little ones, because I've done cooking programs with them, they love being in the kitchen <laughs> and yeah. making stuff. I did um, zombie guts with a group of little oh, kids. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that was fun. It's basically just cinnamon rolls with lots of food coloring. But <laughs> they're, they're just a treat to bring into the kitchen and work with. What great ideas. Yeah. yeah oh, I'm fun. so impressed. And I think it's just amazing. You're going, you've just got so many offerings that would appeal. Yeah. And then even if there's someone who's a little different out there, you've got something for that kid too. Yeah, there really is something for everyone. And I love that. All of our programs are free. You know, oh. that is the, the purpose of the library is to offer Ooh, educational, cultural true. entertainment. And it's because of the people in this community who are donating to the foundation that we're able to right. do that. Before the pandemic, 2019, uh, 20,000 people came to library programs. Wow, yeah. that's a huge number. It was our record, yeah. I wouldn't have thought that. It's incredible. So now, do things have to be registered for? Or? Some, it depends on the program. Sometimes yep. you might need to limit. Right, it can be related to space or supplies. Oh yeah. That so, space. oh my goodness. Yes. Yes, I imagine you do have to worry about that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So, but it sounds like you've got such a wonderful programming going with you and your committees and whatever. Now, what about volunteers? Is there a need for that? We always have a need for, for volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, it was so up and down during the pandemic. And oh, yeah. what the one thing that we have lost and we're going to have to sort of rebuild is we had this phenomenal group of teens who were involved in our teen advisory board. They volunteered at all of our programs. I mean, for example, we did um, a trick-or-treat trail in the building. We did Extreme Candyland. I mean, we get two, 300 people and oh we could my. never do these without those teen volunteers. Right. Setting up, tearing down, being there, running the games. Well those kids have graduated and moved. We still have a couple. So we're sort of rebuilding this wonderful, um, consistent group, this teen audience that we had that came to all of our teen nights. And, mm -hmm. and because of that pandemic, you know, you weren't getting the younger kids to sort of fill the ranks of the older kids. Oh, right. Um, so we would love to have some of, um, re-engage with some of the teens. Right. And um, and we also use volunteers to do things like shelf books and weed books and, and help with all that. And the Friends of the Library always need volunteers to help with their book sales and oh, yes. uh, sort the donated books that come in and get them priced for the sale room. Yes. Yeah, so there's a lot of really fun opportunities. There's a lot of need there. And, and um, I think the 
is that contact information going to be on your site? Yes, we do have a spot on the website. Okay, um, good. Yep, where volunteers can So they can, can go. go right on there. Yes. Oh, this is just so interesting and innovative, and I just have never thought about all these facets of the library. Um, what Now, my next question mm -hmm. is kind of, a, kind of an add-on, but I thought, oh, I've got the librarian here. I have to find out about books. So I'm going to ask you, what are your favorite books? Yes, um, none of the ones that I'm reading for grad school. I'm just going to set that <laughs> aside. Okay. Um, and I did think, like, <laughs> what I think one of my favorite books, perhaps of all time, but certainly in recent years, is State of Wonder by Ann Patchett. Okay. And she is a phenomenal um, writer. I also love Bel Canto, and since you were a music teacher, oh. I highly recommend that to you. It's so yes. beautiful, and the, this opera singer who oh. plays such an integral part of the story. It's an amazing book. Um, and then if you like fiction that's a little edgier, I love um, Dan Schoen. He, my favorite book of his is called Await Your Reply, and it's sort of a mystery. And then he's done a book that I was like so upset about because it was so dark and angry and weird, but I can't stop thinking about it. So that says, I mean, it's been a year and I still think about that book. Wow. So if you like those kinds of dark, edgier reads, Dan Schoen is called Ill Will. And it's, it's not uplifting to say the least, but it's captivating. And then for nonfiction, yeah. um, one of my favorite all times is, it's called The Worst Hard Times. Um, by Timothy Egan, and it's about the Dust Bowl, oh. and it's it's just so well done. Um, and one of those nonfiction writers who can talk about social issues and experiences in a way that is very much it feels like a story, hmm. but it's packed full of information. And then, um, as a Laura Ingalls fan, Prairie oh, Fires yes. by Caroline Fraser, which won the Pulitzer. Oh, and um, it is the quintessential Laura Ingalls book. Oh, wow. So I, if, if you're a fan, it, it can get kind of dense, um, but you know, you can skip around. I still recommend it if you think, oh, this is a little more detail, well then just go to the next chapter. That's okay, we're allowed right. to do that. <laughs> Nobody can tell us how we read our books, right? <laughs> so That's right. So those are um, on the top of my exactly list. Exactly right. Yes. I'm not a, a, a avid reader but when I do read I sit there and I can't break away and it's hard yeah. and, and sometimes I go into the night and I think what have you done do you like audiobooks I have tried that especially when I've been traveling like yeah. 400 miles or, or whatever you know I, I cannot and stand I put to in be an audio book I just can't but anyway oh the time has so, gone so fast oh gosh, we yeah. have to I could keep talking and talking I I just I think I just have to have you back on. I would love that. Because um, it's so interesting, everything you've told me, and I'm just so excited to hear all that about the library. I think it's, I think it's just, I don't know, one of our crowning glories in Hudson is that beautiful library. And we do a lot of things with art, so you, sometime we can come talk really more about You really got art. a nice program going there where you brought in a lot of extra subjects even. Yes, yes. Yeah. So anyway, thank you so much for coming this today, so Shelley. I really enjoyed this. So, I've never met you before. Yeah, it was a pleasure to meet you. But I you. do feel like I know you. Well, and I, I know what you like at this point. Yes, you do. <laughs> so thanks so much for thank coming you. on the show. I appreciate it. And I have it. to say, I know our audience will love this. Good. And I will thank the audience for listening today and hope you enjoyed hearing about the Hudson Public Library and reading and all kinds of things. So thank you for watching our show.